first Caminos when we were starting with the with the Camino people, but due to the, all this craziness and and when we have the our old Instagram account taken down, uh, it's taken us two years to to finally get in touch. Right. Yeah, I was gonna say I thought it was it was somewhere two years, maybe a little. Probably even more. Yeah. Nice, yeah. So how are you guys? Uh, we are here in Spain. So for the ones that know, uh, finally, Easter uh, probably has been already passed by the time we release this podcast. So no Camino for Easter, only people that are in the communities, in your local communities. So people from Santan, from Galicia can go to Santiago. Here in Navarra, we, we can walk across Navarra. But still, we have no option to walk through the whole Camino. But what is weird is that international people can supposedly come to Spain and walk. So one of those things that we, I, I don't know, it's just weird, but we keep finding people, there's Madrid is full of French people that come for the weekend. There's pilgrims going around and saying that you can walk through another community because you are already on your way. So I think that probably, you know, by the, by May, we will have some kind of like normal and people will be able to, at least from Europe, to start walking again. And, and my best guess is for, for international pilgrims to be able to walk around September. But I think that will depend on the on the passport that they are saying that is going to be implemented to keep track of the people with the vaccination. So how are you guys doing over there in the States? Uh, well, we are doing mostly well. There's, there's, still, uh, there's still additional work to be done, clearly. Mm -hmm. I, I looked at it a few days ago when we had, um, we're making good strides on getting vaccinated. The area that I live in, San Antonio, Texas, has, uh, we're, we're a little bit ahead of the, both the state average and the national average getting people vaccinated, but then we're a huge medical city. There's multiple, mm -hmm. there, uh, multiple significant medical resources here. So that's between the fact that the, the medical providers are prioritized in getting vaccinated and so many people work in the health system mm -hmm. uh, and then doing the best they can to be efficient in getting all of the different age group categories vaccinated. We're, we are a little bit ahead of the curve, but there's still a long way to go. Uh, but we are able to travel. I mean, we do, we've got we've got unrestricted travel uh, okay. around the country so we we've got that advantage if, if there were a camino here we'd all be able to walk it there's mm -hmm. many caminos i'm like you have the pct you have the palatian so many caminos not like the camino i that's one of those things you know i still the, the, they're so different but i i hope one day i can have four months to walk a whole the pct bed or part of the palatian have you walked any of those that's, uh uh, the answer to your question is no. Uh, I haven't walked those. The, the main difference, though, is like you said, it's not like the Camino, in that it is it is the the more traditional understanding of the through hike yeah. where That's where you've got full, to carry everything. A know, full survival know. mode because you have to go through the four seasons. You have to go through snakes, bears, and all of stuff. As I say, that's Camino can be for everyone. The PCT or the Palatine is not for everyone, not at all. Right. Absolutely not for everybody. There's mm -hmm. they, that takes a, a much more uh, robust capability of self being able to self sustain. Yeah, mental and physical. Because I, I hear stories and they're they're incredible. Anyway, so let's go to the Camino. You know, we always start with all MBTs. We go through the one minute questionnaire. So as you know, hey. I hope that you have listened to any of the podcast because we randomize all the questions, so you can get some that. You probably listen, but some maybe not. So you will have one minute to answer as many questions as you can. Are you ready? All right, let's go. First Camino. First Camino is 2016 uh, in September. And How many Caminos? Four. One city. One city. Uh, Astorga. One meal. Uh, lentils, lentil soup. A song. Mm, I don't know any songs. Honestly, I'm not a music person. I don't trust you. Come on. One meal. <laughs> oh, you already said one meal. Uh, stage on the way. Stage on the way. Uh, I, it's not a full stage, but the thing that I like the best is walking from the base up to 
Osebrero from uh, I can't pronounce it right, but Herreras Osebrero. Yeah. We'll work in rolling their ass for another chapter. Uh, yeah. uh, coffee with <laughs> milk or, or or espresso? Espresso. Uh, Apple or Android? Android. Camelback or canteen? Canteen. Uh, a beer. Uh, no beer. I'm I'm not a beer drinker. Either wine, either wine or yerbas. Uh, a backpack brand. Osprey. Siesta. Uh, more yeah. <laughs> that was easy. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so that's always a great way. And it always says how funny it is that when we start thinking of the Camino, all those memories, even for me, they start, you know, coming to my mind. I'm like, I remember Ocebrero, that step up. And I remember the beer I had at the top at the Alto del Pollo. That's one of the best beers I ever had in the whole Camino too. But anyway, let's go to business. And I always start with the same question, Steve, is how did you find out about the Camino de Santiago and, and when in your life was that moment? Yeah, um, it was somewhere about 2010, 2011. And I saw an, a, a story about it in a magazine. Mm -hmm. And so I read that article and then I went online and looked at it a little bit. And I thought, well, that looks pretty interesting. That would be something that I ought to do eventually, you know, as a, you know, a someday oh, nice. idea. For the to-do list. Right. Um, wasn't really thinking too seriously, just it sounded like it'd be fun. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, oh, a couple, um, couple of years, almost three years later, I entered um, some little giveaway contest where you, and put, put the name in the hat and the prize was a DVD of the way. And well, there's multiple prizes. The prize that I got was the DVD of the way. And what um, kind of giveaway was it to have a DVD from oh, the way? It was, uh, there was just, it was all types of things. It, and I'm not even sure how they selected it, if it was okay. random. Or so it what. wasn't like any church or hiking related anything. It was just total no. random stuff. Yeah, it was just all random different things. And so I watched that, which reminded me of this reading that I had done a couple of years prior. And then, then I thought, okay, I really, now I really want to do this. It, it really piqued my interest more. It went from being just kind of in the back of my mind to the front of mm -hmm. my mind. And I went and uh, I was still in the army at the time. So I started looking at opportunities to go and well, it requires, it requires a lot of leave. Hmm, a whole and, month for being in the army. That's not that easy. Yeah. And so I, so it was always, well, I'll try again, you know, try the next commander, see if I can get time off. And ultimately I got all the way up until my retirement date. And I thought, well, this actually worked out well because I've spent this long career in the army and to just wake up one morning and not put a uniform on, that's not a really good transition plan. You know, it is a transition, but it's not a really good mm -hmm. transition plan. And I need to, I need to spend some time dedicated to figuring out what I'll do next, mm -hmm. leaving military ministry behind and, and doing something in the civilian world. And well, as we were talking before the show, you don't, you don't have time when you're at home, even when you think you have time, right? What the pandemic has proven to everyone, even when you're stuck at home, you're still too busy. And uh, also with, with careers like you're in the, in the, in the, in the army, and like my dad was in the military too. I'm like, you don't have time for anything. And, and as you say, it's preparing for something so big and, and I don't know why I'm sometimes we prepare, but we don't prepare for the important stuff. Yeah. And so I said, I said, I will not, have, you know, I will have finished the, uh, the one I'll finish the army. Mm -hmm. I will not have started anything else. So let me just take advantage of those first few weeks getting out um, and going and turning off the phone 
and walking and thinking and praying and and figuring out you know what I want to do next. So did you have plan in advance like what was that Camino was going to look like or was it a thing of finishing the army and then you started planning? Uh, my plan, it was a really good one. It was get off the plane and start walking. Love that was it. my plan. <laughs> and, and you know, we have a dear friend that he did a, a, a research about the, best, the motivations of pilgrims to go on the Camino and we found out that this is one of the best ones, the, the, the highest one, you know, the time you need a change in your life. And usually when this happens, there's no preparation at all. Usually people is like, I hear from people from Australia that from one day to the other, they lost their job. And in one week they were here in Spain walking the Camino de Santiago. Right. Still for me, it's unbelievable how, you know, the world works and, but. So tell us a little bit to backtrack a little bit into your army life. Where were you serving? Do you been serving always in the States or you've been serving all over the, the world? Uh, primarily in the States. I, I started in the army in uh, 85. Mm -hmm. I was a paratrooper, a paracadista. Uh, I was two years old by the time. <laughs> <laughs> Just to compare, you were a parachute and I was two years old, more or less the yeah. same. Almost the same, yeah. And so I did that for many years and uh, hit a point in, in the career that was fostering a transition. Mm -hmm. So I, I left the army briefly, no, briefly a few years and went through the seminary education and ordination process and then returned to the army as a chaplain. So I, I kind of say I have two careers in one and then spent the remainder of my time as as a chaplain so when i was when i was enlisted and i was a paratrooper i was primarily in the united states and a few short trips to central america so honduras and uh, salvador but other than that pretty much um entirely in the united states and then when i went, came back into the army as a as a chaplain after that couple of years of, of training and ordination, then I was still primarily in the United States, but spent 15 months in Iraq mm -hmm. and a very brief, a very brief stay in Germany and a, and a brief amount of time in Korea. But other than that, in the United States. Mm -hmm. Incredible. So then after that, the day counts finally and you are finally free. Uh, right. How was the process of living, you know, and I, and I always, and we talked the other day with uh, some of the soldiers also, and the change of finally, you know, not getting to the plane with all your gear, all those backpacks, suddenly you are out there being just you, Steve, and open to the wall. Uh, it's kind of strange. Um, and I'll say there's a, and there's, there's almost a, uh, what would be the best way to say it? It's almost a halfway leaving the army when you live in San Antonio, because there's a very large army base here, like mm -hmm. Fort Sam Houston. There's a smaller base, Camp Bullis. And then there's two major air force bases and a real small air force airfield. So if you're not involved in medicine, in San Antonio, you're involved you in the be. military. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, my neighborhood is all people who are either currently serving or are veterans. Oh, yeah. And it's not like I would, went back to one of the towns, one of the places I lived growing up where there's mm -hmm. no military influence, where it would be this completely like culture shock. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's it, it it does make for a gentler, a gentler. Yeah, at least that the community supports you in the way of changing and, and 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 you think alike and you do things alike and hmm. and so you still see the same people not every day nothing big change. Right, because there there's a there's a culture there's a culture to itself in the military and yeah. and you'll and you mentioned 
uh, your dad, you may have noticed this. If you if you did any travel or, or working with with people from other nations, soldiers from other nations, that I frequently find that soldiers from different countries get along better with each other than they do with their own countrymen, because there's such a distinct military culture that really is almost universal. It's not 100% universal, but it's all- I, it's I guess that, that is like, like, like the Camino family, no? I feel like there is a community that no matter where you go, that if you start talking with someone and suddenly you realize that both have walked the Camino, it's like being a scout or that suddenly yeah. you have that kind of connection that you're like, I don't care where you're coming from. I don't care what you do. Suddenly we are friends. Like, like you and Very I we just met here. And, but with the people that is closer, you have that fight also in all the different brands of the, the, the army, the military, you have all those internal fights, who is higher, who's better. It's a funny that's way, but, it, but it's also true there, no? It, no, that's, that, is, that is true because all those other branches keep thinking that they're the best and they're just wrong. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hurrah. Uh, we will well, have to ask, ask them one day. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, you finally left everything behind and you arrived to Spain. What were your thoughts? And like, you decided to walk the, the whole real Camino, as we were talking before, from Saint Jean, the one that it's supposed to be now the only yeah. one? Or were you, you know, the way? I'm just going to follow what I saw on the way because it's kind of cool. Or did you even, you know, research anything more about it? Just go with this and it's easy. Let's do it. No, I... Um... I went and my intention was to start in Saint Jean, mm -hmm. um, but then there were some commitments that kind of got inserted onto my calendar by other people uh, that shortened the amount of time that I had available. And so I ended up having, I think 18 days available, 19 okay. days available. So I figured how how much I could walk per day, roughly, and then I just backed up and it put me at Lyon. So I started in Lyon. It's funny because I was wondering why the Warriors on the Way starts in Astorga. Now I can put the two together and, and based on your experience, I will walk farther on. But so you then start in Lyon, okay? I started in Lyon, and and that really worked out. Uh, it worked out well. I. I do have a desire to see the the, the first half of the Frances. Uh, you know, uh, as you say, it's the best part. And Pamplona, the best city of the whole Camino. I think we should do the Camino backwards. But anyway, I don't think the Galicians will agree with me. We'll see. <laughs> probably, probably not. Um, but then, so I, I did, I, I walked, um, but I did not get a map. Uh, I did not get a guidebook. I, I knew when I where I was going to start in mm -hmm. Leon and I knew where I was going to end Santiago and, and nothing than, in between no reservations no looking on websites no anything the only reservation I made because I had a a late arrival time into Leon the only reservation I made is I made a hotel reservation in Leon because I didn't want to get there when it was dark and mm -hmm. try to find lodging uh, so I I went that first, that um, that that first night, I made a reservation in a hotel, and then I got up and I walked out and I just started following arrows. I got lost almost immediately. <laughs> uh, got turned around. Uh, probably, probably added an hour or so to my first day uh, because of that. But then, I walked the first day. And right near the end, I started walking with a with another gentleman, and he said he was stopping in the in the next town, and it was uh, Hospital Abigo. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, well, I think I want to walk to. And I had seen a sign somewhere that had uh, for a town. I said, I think I want to walk to this town called whatever. It was. And he goes, oh, we passed that five, six kilometers ago. <laughs> yeah, because Hospital de Orbigo is, is farther than the, the average stage. I'm like, the Hospital de Orbigo from Leon is about 30K. And so I was like, oh, in that case, I'll, I'll go ahead and stop. And he said, do you have a reservation? I said, no, I don't have a reservation. I didn't even plan on stopping here. 
And he says, it's okay. He said, I was walking with somebody else, but he quit a couple of days ago. You can use his reservation. So that's how I got my first bed. <laughs> so your first Camino provides right on the face. Not yeah, bad. right there. So how was the, the life changing? I'm like, suddenly you go from a life where everything is set up, you know, minute by minute, everything is a square. Everything has to be so clean, so tight. And then you wake up on the first morning. How was the feeling of waking up in Leon, seeing the cathedral and, and having the whole Camino ahead of you? It was, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, because like you said, everything is tight and clean and, and the, when, uh, when I was still enlisted and I was a paratrooper, we would rig aerial drops for, to drop equipment with. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a saying, it's a tight load is a happy load because <laughs> you're not going to lose anything. And so I would always, I would get my stuff and I had a distinct, this is how I pack my pack. And then you cinch everything down tight and then you take and you roll up the, the, the straps and mm -hmm. you rubber band them in place. So there's nothing dangling, nothing loose, everything. And I start walking and I've, these people have got stuff just hanging off every direction. I'm like, who are these hippies? <laughs> it's funny because I've been doing that all my life. I'm super, you know, oh, a little bit, even in the OCD, everything is packed, even my room, you know, everything is collider. I probably got that from my dad. And I think, you know, there's one way to pack things. You will never carry anything hanging on your backpack. I've been teaching that all my life. And the first day I went to the Camino, I see people walking all over with all kinds of differences. So I'm like, you're not going to make it. You're not going to make it. I don't even think you're going to make it to Pamplona. Uh, that is not even a backpack. <laughs> yeah. And so they, so that was, that was a big, that was, it was a big shock to see that there was a different way to carry a backpack. And doing and, things and, and, and that it was okay. And yeah. And, and, the, and they were all fine. They, they, they were, or less. they were happy. They were doing well. And the, the, the fact that I was looking at him thinking you're going to lose half of your stuff before you, before you even make it to lunch. Um, they didn't, well, you know, they did, they did their Camino their way and we were happy doing it. So, so that was, that was probably the biggest shocker because I had a very clear understanding of how you, how, how you ruck march as, as we call it in the army. Mm -hmm. ruck march. Yeah. There's a way to, um, and it's you pack up all your stuff and you pack it by a certain load plan and they pack it tight and you walk and you walk fast and and nobody else was doing it the way i was doing it and it took it took a while which which worked out because that's why i caught up to that other gentleman <laughs> <laughs> yeah i remember going to the alberga and everything you know clothes all over the place everything was a nightmare i'm like why is so much easier to keep everything in your place, everything tidy? You know, you go, you open your backpack, you put whatever. There's certain ways, but at the end, everything comes out properly. So, how was that first day? I'm like, was it what you expected from the from the movie? Was it what you expected from that magazine you read, or or was totally different? Uh, the magazine probably gave me a more clear understanding. I like I like to call the movie the the coffee table picture book version of the Camino. I think that's the best way to describe the way that I ever heard. A coffee because, table book of the Camino, totally. Yeah, because because it's not that it's distinctly inaccurate. It just, no, no, it gives just, you the highlights. It gives you the, got the highlights, the beautiful moments, the most beautiful pictures, and they put a story that is amazing with an amazing set of actors and everything comes yeah. up, yeah. Um, and so the so the magazine article was was much more aimed towards the person who wants to make a pilgrimage, wants to have that experience of endurance and a little self denial. Mm -hmm. So that was so that was more more um, accurate as far as just how the feeling went, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but. You know, I got up and I started walking. I think I was walking at five o'clock or so. And I did not realize the one thing that the art, the journal article did not show, the movie did not show, I had no idea about, is that 
the day starts later in Spain than the day starts in the United States. And the, and the day starts in the, in the army earlier than the day starts in the United States, which is earlier than the day starts in Spain. So, you know, if you're gonna road march and if you're gonna carry yourself, you get up really early and you do it before the sun's gonna beat you. And so I was up and walking at five o'clock and I fully expected to be able to find food come six or six thirty. And no, no, you don't. As, as I say, no way, Jose. <laughs> no, not at all. And so I, um, so I walked, and um, I started getting hungry. I started getting thirsty. Didn't have, uh, had not, had not. Um, packed enough water. So I went, uh, I, I was empty on water rather quickly. Really? A Marine getting yeah. empty on water? Uh, well, I expected my regular refill points. <laughs> <laughs> to be up another time now. And so, um, so I went and I would see a cafe up ahead, a little bar up ahead and I would, I'd stop, not open, keep walking get there not open it's sunrise it's starting to get warm i'm like well now places will start opening i get to the next one not open and then eventually i saw way out ahead on the left hand side so i had to cross over the 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 road i was on the highway that i was on uh, going out of leon uh, however far we're, we're a couple hours into it i'm a couple hours into it and but i saw a truck stop And it's like, well, truck stops in the United States, they're open 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. And so I said, and they've all have little restaurants attached to them. Mm -hmm. That open 24 hours. They're open 24 hours. So I'm like, well, great. Breakfast. I really wasn't, I really wasn't expecting uh, truck stop food. I want to have the Camino experience, mm -hmm. right? But it, it's getting to the point where I'm hungry. So I'm going to, I want to eat wherever I can find a place open. Uh, so I go and I get there and it's closed. <laughs> uh, but there was a vending machine. There was a, there was a, a beer machine. And I, uh, I told you in the, in the minute questions, I don't, I don't drink beer, but I had changed my mind at that moment. So I put my Euro in and I got my beer and I just, finished that beer as fast as I could um, and started walking again. And then the next, the next place that I got to, no, the next place was closed as well, but there was a person who had bought groceries the night before. And so he was just using one of the outside tables mm -hmm. to eat his own groceries. So then the next one after that was finally open. And so I went in and I sat down and I, I think it's a little after nine at this point. Mm -hmm. And so um, I had been trying to learn Spanish before going. And there, and it's some people make it out to be more than it is, you know, but there is a difference between at least a few words in Spain and when you're. The people teaching you are speaking the Spanish that is, um, well, it's, it's formed in Mexico and then it's further yeah. adjusted yeah. here yeah. in Texas, <laughs> right? And so I sat down and he asked me, the, the waiter asked me what I wanted. And I said, papas con huevos. And he just kind of shakes his head like, Don't and and I go okay. I'm tired. I flew in yesterday. I got in late. I got up early. I've been walking all morning. I'm hungry and I'm thirsty. Take time. Pronounce everything right. You know, clearly this is my fault. You know, so and so, papas con huevos. No. And I was like. Okay, I, I don't know then. 
And so he asked me if I wanted a tortilla. And I thought, oh, sure. You know, I'll tortillas, eat yeah, that's. Yeah, I'll, I'll eat a couple tortillas. I'll have some coffee. I'll go up the, I'll go up the road a little bit further and I'll try again. And he, he brings me out a wedge of tortilla, a slice of tortilla. tortilla. De patata. Yeah. Yeah. Not tortilla. Not Mexican tortilla. Yeah. Not wrap up your taco. <laughs> <laughs> and so I look at it and I look at him and I take the fork and I kind of flake it apart and I, get, I push a little bit of egg over and I point at it with the fork and I say, Huevos, you must say huevos. And I point at the potatoes and I say, papas. He goes, no, no papas, patatas. I was like. <laughs> your, your first day was worth a tweet or at least a whole thread. <laughs> like, it's, it's funny as hell. <laughs> it was, it's a, how much frustration over <laughs> one word variation? Because I got exactly what I was asking for. Uh, cooked a little bit different, but exactly yeah, what I was. Thinking. But technically, it was kind of like it, it was really. Yeah, uh, it is incredible <laughs> because I, I have kind of like the same with one of my really good friends on my first Caminos. He was from Chicago, and we arrived to Hospital de Orbigo on a Sunday, and of yeah. course, twelve o'clock, nothing was open. Everyone had gone to church. There was only one bar, and there were you know just the the people from the locals drinking wine, not much food because the day there wasn't any kitchen. And it's like, why is not anything open in Spain? I'm like, it's a Sunday. We go to church, you go to the bar, you go home. And then in the afternoon, if you're lucky, something will open a little bit, but probably in a little village, not even the, the main store, the groceries will open on a Sunday, probably not even a Saturday. Now, maybe but in 2017, and she's like, why in the States, everything is open 24 seven, you can get a haircut on a Sunday. I'm like, I know, but this is Spain. Yeah. So it's it's quite a change. And I, I actually appreciate, I, I appreciate the more relaxed, schedule mm -hmm. i i think it for people who are will not and, and at least in the states i don't think most people will mo most people will not discipline themselves to have a little bit of margin in their life yeah and so when the culture just and, and the law, the because here is, is the law i'm like is this even illegal to open some of the stores they cannot open on a sunday for example by law oh yeah we used to have that, but they were struck down as unconstitutional. Yeah. Hmm. That's for me, one of the biggest changes was the whole, are you finding everything okay? Are you finding everything okay? Like going to a restaurant here in Spain, also the, the American spellings used to make fun because we have to yell at the, the barman. I'm like, hey, you over here. I'm like, I will never do that on my whole life in the States. You don't even think about it. Here is normal. And for people who are such a same and like the beginning, they will feel in weird. And I'm like, no, no, this is the way we go in Spain. If you don't yell to the guy or you just make yourself visible, you're not going to have lunch, breakfast, or anything. So you better start doing it right now or yeah. you're not going to eat your way up to Santiago. Well, you know, funny, you know, funny story you said about things being closed. You want another, a, a, another funny story that I had <laughs> is about food. <laughs> <laughs> As I get, I, I get to where I'm going to stop. I don't think it was Sunday, but it was definitely during siesta. Yeah. That's also summer is siesta plus the Tour of France. And so I sit, I, uh, I sit down and there's menus on the table. So I open up the menu and the waiter comes over and he said, and he tells me, sorry, but the kitchen is closed. No. And I, I'm like, so there's no food. There's no, there's no food. Okay. And I said, can I get a glass of wine? Oh yeah, we, there's wine available. There's no food. Okay. So he leaves, he comes back a few minutes later with a glass of wine and a small side plate. And it's got a slice of bread with a fried egg and a slice of hummus on the bread. And I said, there's no food. There's no, there's no food. I said, I'll have a couple more of these glasses of wine with this no food right here. <laughs> <laughs> that will take care of the lunch that I've been missing. <laughs> That's what things about a lot of people when, when we start, you know, in St. John, people, we go to Pamplona, I take them to good bars in Pamplona and Pamplona. 
you know, when you go to the bars for tapas, it's expensive because it's kind of like, you know, Nouvelle Cuisine is not the typical average tapa that you will get in the Meseta or in Leon. And like, these ones are worth paying. And people ask like, from the States, oh, this is so cheap. I'm like, no, no, this is expensive. Wait till you get to, to, to the Meseta and you get free food with the drinks. So when people in Hospital de Orbigo, when we went to the hotel that didn't have the, the kitchen open, we asked for a couple of beers and they give us a plate of seafood, as like a sal seafood salad, something like that. And it was like a whole plate for full of us. It was, you know, not a meal, but but close to. And it was the same like you. And like the, the ladies were like, okay, five more beers, five more of this. We're done. Yeah. The discover of the free tapa here in Spain. <laughs> yeah, there's a there's a place not a not a uh, not frequented by pilgrims. It was it was slightly off, but I'd gotten turned around, so I f found it very fortunately. Um, in Palas de Rey that I went in and I ordered a drink there. And when the person brought the drink, brought this large plate of different sliced meats. Mm -hmm. And, really and really I thought to myself, it's like, oh, I didn't, I didn't order that. And, and so, you know, so I asked how much and it was three euro or something, three or four euro. You're like, like, oh, I'll do this yeah, again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It is funny because here we have the opposite. When you go to an Italian restaurant, they will charge you for the bread, the olives, the, the you know all that kind of crap, and they charge you like five, seven euros. But when you go to one of these village bars, they give you more food than the wine, and you get a wine for like one euro or something, super cheap. Yeah. And the tapas, I had burgers for tapas. I have you know soup. It's incredible. I even have a whole tortilla that here in Pamplona is two fifty for nothing in other places. So, but still in Pamplona, remember no tapas. Tapas from Logroño on. And once you start getting closer to Galicia, you need to know where to go. So if you want to know the good places, we will tell you maybe another day we'll do a tapas. We and you right. can review the, the good tapas places of the Camino. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> so let us go a little bit into your professional life. As you say, you start in the, in the army as a, as a parachuter, but then you went into the clergy. And one of the things that, I, you know, for me, it's really incredible about the Camino is hope. It doesn't matter what religion. You know, a lot of people, they think that the Camino is just for Catholics. I'm Catholic myself. But for you, I guess you're Christian. I don't know which denomination, but how do you feel the Camino is for the ecumenical and for the people joining, you know, from different cultures, different religions? And how was for you jumping from a, a lot of people ask me, you know, in the States, we have all those religions, denominations. Here in Spain, it's super hard to find uh, all something different than Catholic. Now it's growing, but it's not as easy in the States that everything is so normal. You have the chapel here, the other one, the other one. They are all kind of like the banks, one in front of the other, fighting to get people to heaven faster or, or better. <laughs> so how was your get of, of coming to Spain as a clergy and getting into the Catholic Camino? Oh, no, that, that's, um, it, it's great. The, the, like you said, the Camino itself is open and welcoming of anybody and everybody who shows up ready to, to walk or ride horse or, or, or bicycle. Although I, I still hold the bicycle in suspicion, I think. But, uh, <laughs> right now, legally, you can even sail the Camino and scuba dive the Camino. They have set it up uh, the, the stones in the in the Atlantic, so you can scuba dive the Camino. That would be interesting. That would maybe be we can get a bunch of your guys and do a, a sailing, a scuba diving, and arriving sail into Santiago. Yeah. That can be pretty impressive. Yeah. So the um, the but the the Camino is wonderful. The, the reality that it's, that it's been a pilgrimage route for so long. And so, um, you know, thousands, the last few years, thousands a day arrive in, mm -hmm. in Santiago, right? So you've got, you have thousands of people daily walking um, a good number of, not all, especially not now as, as the scope has broadened so much, mm -hmm. but still a good number of them making distinctly spiritual religious pilgrimages and and praying as they walk the the there's just a uh, oh, a naturally occurring spirituality to to the space the, that that ground has has been made sacred through continual use yeah, that's why I, I always say that the Camino has something different. That that's why people go to Santiago. I don't know, you know, you can call it spirituality, you can call it faith, you can call it religion, you can call it whatever you want. But 
why people go to the, to Santiago instead of going to the PCT or is going to any other trail worldwide? There must be something there. Yeah, and and that's something that I I bring up with people as well. I was being asked the other day, it's like, what do you, what would you tell somebody? A young person was the question. I think, what would you tell a young person that wants to make the Camino? And I said, I said, well, the first thing I would do is rather than say something, tell them something is ask them something. And why are you walking the Camino hmm. rather than somewhere else? And I think whether the person whether the person has conscious recognition of it or not. I think everybody who chooses to walk the Camino rather than one of the other many trails around the world is that they're looking for that connection with something bigger. Right? I agree. And I think that sometimes they don't know that they're looking for that connection. I have a, a incredible story about my, in my last Camino Portuguese, I found this group of kids that were 17, 18 years old from, from Spain, you know, in their year here. When you transition into college, usually that summer you go to Salo to party, go to this coast, you or you go into your gap year, or you travel to Europe into the interrail. So these kids went to a, a couple of summer concerts, but then decided to walk the Camino and the Portuguese, not the French. So we start walking a couple of days, start chatting with them, you know, getting to know and really nice, you know, but kind of like in the with earring here, kind of like with a mohawk. Those kids, they were, they were all, there were five of them, they were really different from the one that went to church when he was a kid for the ones that they don't even know what it is. And after all these days, we were arriving to Santiago and one of them, that they had, the one that will look, that if you go on the street, probably you will think, you know, this kid is lost forever. And he told me, you know, I was thinking, what happened if now we arrive to Santiago and we try to find you and, and you know, your number doesn't exist, you are not on Instagram and all the stuff that you've been teaching us through the Camino and everything. And you were walking with us, but you are not really there. And I like, you know what you're describing is the Bible. And he was like, what? <gasps> and that's the point that I said, you know, if you go to the Camino, you're looking for something. I don't know what it is, but the beauty of the Camino is that puts all of that together. And I remember why like these kids and, and we're with a, with a bunch of teachers from the States and they were like under 60s, you know, kind of like getting close to retirement. And in the summer, that's usually a, an average pilgrim is an American teacher. Mm -hmm. And we're having a couple of beers and the teacher start talking with the kids and he's like, you know, I will never be able to do this with my kids in the state. You are minor. We're here having a beer. And they were talking as equals and that was surprising for the kids, surprising for the people. And that's one of the things that I always say, uh, I don't know where else in the world you can get that kind of conversation. Right. Yeah, true. I don't know anywhere in the, in the world. So I don't know how it was for you, you know, the whole being a chaplaincy and going into the, sure. the Camino and, and leading into, were you active in the, in the mass? Were you active in any way? Yeah, the, the interesting thing on that, you talk about talking with others. The, on the first Camino, I, I spent a, a good bit of time walking with these three young ladies from Germany. And well, Spain, the Camino, it's, it's absolutely littered with the, with the signs of, of Christendom. Mm -hmm. And when we, we walk past something, it's like, well, I wonder what that is. And I would look, oh, well, that's this or that's that. Well, I wonder who that is. Oh, that's Saint so-and-so. Okay. <laughs> and after four or five of these, one of them says, well, how do you know all these things? How do you know so much? Because I'm a priest, that's why. <laughs> then, that was my next question. Like, do you present yourself as a priest or not? <laughs> And, and not when we were first walking, we just, and then all of a sudden it was, it was, it was kind of a, a surprise. And they said, well, we're, we're spiritual. We're not religious. I'm like, oh, okay. Hmm. And, um, and at first it would, it really kind of created attention for them. Yeah. And, it, and they repeated that a few times, you know, we're spiritual, not religious. They're trying to yeah. make the gap and separate themselves for you. And I said, okay. And I don't know the third time, maybe fourth time that that somehow got brought back up. I said, okay, well, I'm not the one that keeps bringing it up. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, but I do want to ask you a question. What's that? I said, what do you mean by being spiritual? And and we, we kind of went back and forth and an answer. And it's like, oh, I'm not quite sure I'm understanding that. And you know, like, keep kind of teasing out the answer a little bit. Mm -hmm. 
And then finally one said, we're looking for a connection with something bigger. I said, that I can, that, that I get, that I understand. I said, and that, at that level, we're 100% in agreement with each other. Mm -hmm. I, said, I said, now I'll add to it. I said, when I add to it, that, that something bigger is God. And I make that connection through the person of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. I said, but as far as just the basic definition of spirituality, you're trying to connect to something bigger. Yeah, we, we're in agreement. Yeah, totally agree. You know, we are searching both for, for that, the same thing. Yes, I know the name of what I'm looking for. And then you are on searching of that way of connection. And, and from that point on, every day, it was, we just were able to have a conversation. And it's like, okay, well, I like that part. I don't like that part. And, and, and it, was a, it was a really uh, wonderful interaction for, for the whole rest of the way. Um, and that was just like pilgrim to pilgrim stuff. Uh, you asked a second ago, as far as participating and celebrating the mass. And as I celebrate the mass every morning that, um, that I'm on the Camino. And if, if I've got access to it, if I've got access to a church, then I'll use the altar there. Otherwise set up in wherever mm -hmm. I can. The one, the one thing the army taught me how to do is celebrate the mass on yeah. any flat surface. <laughs> And even if not so flat, that one of the things that we do in the scouts that is kind of like the same. You know, here, yes, we can plan it. There is no need for more. It is funny because right. in in my first camino, I find a, a young priest. I think he was from Holland, and he was walking every day with these old, you know, hiking military probably boots. But he was walking with the whole priest, you know, the old style. And then when oh, we okay. arrive to the albergue, he will put on you know normal shirt, a polo, and flip flops. And I ask him, why when you walk, you know, you are doing the hardest, and he's walking. It's like because. I knew that in the Camino, people would look at me weirdly, but finally they will approach me looking for answers. But when I'm in town, they already know, and this is my break time. And I was quite surprised. Yeah. I've actually thought about that myself for the next, for the next time I, I walk, not with my group um, because they all know who I am and, mm -hmm. you know, but the next time I have an opportunity to walk one as an individual, And I have a friend that he's a bishop and I ask him, you know, why do you go as a clerman every day? And he's like, because this is, you know what? I know people is going to judge me for that, but also people is going to approach me for that. And, you know, here in Spain right now, all the new priests, they grow the beer, they go with the clerman, you know, they are more, more sane than the Pope in, in a way. This is a new, but in sometimes I get it. And I agree with you, you know, there should be a way to distinguish yourself in the Camino because I, th and one of the things that I have in the Camino is people go to the Camino searching. I have this, kids one of kids they were like college from german one of them was walking even barefoot and, and we have this couple of days you know we went back and forth really nice but they weren't spiritual at all and then we arrived to this place and and i was like you know i'm going to to mass and do you guys want to come because we have a a time of singing with the nuns at del verge and they're like yeah but we don't speak spanish i'm like if you want i will translate for you into english and and you want and they came with us to the to the church and I have this experience with another Italian pilgrim that when we were in Santiago, he went like three times to, to mass. And I asked him, I'm like, Are, do you believe? I'm like, no, nope, but I know that there is something else. Yep. And yeah, very true. And, and the being able to be identified is a perfect story of that not, not too long ago, I was uh, in the store buying something. And after the, after the girl doing the cash register was ringing up the order, she says, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. And she says, what do you think about forgiveness? Of course, I'm in my clericals and collar. And, and, mm -hmm. and so in general, I'm, I'm pretty a big supporter of forgiveness. It's kind of, it's one of the most important parts of the message. <laughs> I think that's the number one, no? <laughs> so, uh, so then she said, I really want to ask you uh, about some stuff that's going on in my life. And she says, I've got a break in whatever time, would you be available? And I said, well, let me go bring this other stuff home and then I'll come back. And so that, yeah, it's, you, you identify yourself when you're out in public so that people who have that need know where they can turn. And I think that really nowadays, you know, with the whole wallet, it is, I think there's more people searching. I think we're going back to a time, you know, let's call it as they said, you know, it's pretty 12 if you don't want to put it on him yet, but I think people are searching and that's why the community is getting so 
so incredible and so full of great people right now. But let's go to to the finish. You finished your Camino. How was the, the arrival to Santiago after finally those days of of freedom? You were finally retired and then you arrived to the to the city of Oz and Santiago. Right. Got to Santiago and was just I was just amazed. I mean, the, the cathedral was wonderful. Uh, 2016 was uh, was the Jubilee year, right? Mm -hmm. So the Holy Door was open. Uh, I think they, it, I think it actually went from middle of October to middle of October. So I got there just before they closed it for the year. Um, and so the whole route of traffic, of course, I didn't know that the route of traffic was, clo was closed. I thought everybody went in a certain way and came out. Mm -hmm. the other. Um, and then when I went back the next time, I was like, okay, we come in over here. Oh, wait, the door is closed. Got to go around <laughs> to the other side. <laughs> um, but just to be able to, to not have... Uh, not have a day of walking ahead of you was a strange feeling. It was both a relief and at the same time, well, then what am I going to do? Mm -hmm. And so explored the city a little bit outside of just the cathedral plaza. Tried a few different restaurants. Went, um, went up actually a fairly significant distance away to where, where the I'm bad with direction, which is a bad thing when you're leading groups, right? But <laughs> there's always. Um, but if you if you're at the if you're at the um, if your back is to the cathedral, mm -hmm. and you go out and to the left and turn out and you go up and um, there's a little park up there. Mm -hmm. And you go past that and you continue walking and then you get up to the university area. Mm -hmm. And so I, I explored all up there because I, I ended up walking faster and further each day than I had scheduled for myself. Mm -hmm. um, not that I had scheduled anything because I didn't have a distinct plan, but I did have a return airline ticket. Mm -hmm. like I have to be done by this day. That was really my only plan. Um, and so I, I knew how many miles I wanted to walk each day. And then I thought, well, if you need a rest day, you don't need a rest day. So I had built in a couple days of margin just in case. Mm -hmm. And so I went actually a little bit further each day than I had kind of had in mind. And I didn't have, take any rest days. So I had three I had my arrival day plus three full days in oh. Santiago. So I went to the old market and bought a bunch of pastries and explored up at the university and just, just did a lot of wandering around. Uh, and then going to, you know, going to the cathedral each day for the mass. And then also right at the, right at the leading edge of that park is, is a nice parish uh, if I remember right, it's Our Lady of the Pillar. Mm -hmm. And so I attended Mass there once. Um, and those three days really were uh, extremely positive for me because it allowed me to really soak in the, in, the, the experience and, and, and help me make sense of it. And so I would be... I, I journaled every day while I was walking. I went back and I read it. And then it's like, okay, well, now that I'm here, looking back at this day, I know this and looking back. At, and it, it really helped make the, make the whole experience much more complete in, huh? in, in what it was doing within me than I think it would have been if I would have immediately jumped on a plane or a train or whatever and left. Mm -hmm. I always tell people, you know, if you have the time to walk to, to Fisterra Moshia for the ones that walk farther, you know, right now there's a research one that's been done in the past years that to be part of the research, they have to, they say that you have to be at least 15 days walking. You know? That's when a real, a pilgrim or a person or whatever, you know, gets the change 
of the way. So I guess the three days that you did in Santiago is what usually, you know, I always go to Muxia and Fisera because those are my days of decompress, you know, of thinking about the Camino. Yeah. It's not the Camino, it's just another Camino, but it's just feeling different. There's not so many people. You already leave Santiago behind. So in your case, uh, the arrival to Santiago was, now you have walked the whole Camino. Was that what you expected? Was it more than you expected or totally different? It was about half what I expected and half different. And it was, I expect, I did expect a significant emotional impact, mm -hmm. but I greatly underestimated just how much of an impact it would be. I think uh, we, we all have the same kind of experience. So I, uh, uh, my, my, My day at Cruz de Ferro was, was incredibly moving. And then that shaped the, the whole rest of the, the whole rest of the walk. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was almost to the point of being overwhelming. Mm -hmm. I guess we all, you know, after watching the movie and saying, you know, there's going to be days of crying, there's going to be days of pain, but once you are there and you experience them in yourself, they're like, yeah. Yep. So then you finish your Camino. You stay three days in Santiago. That's amazing because that also gives you time to see all the people that you went by. And that one of the right. things that I tell every pilgrim, go to the Plaza do Bradoiro for one day and just wait there and see the people arriving. First of all, because it gives you the joy of arriving every time once arrives and you give him a hug. And for me, I love it. It's one of my favorite things of the Camino, just watching the people's faces at the Bradoiro. But also because it gives you that time of the compress, no? So then... Uh, the big sign that you have on your back, warriors on the way, when was it born? Was it something that came out for you to do the Camino? Was something that after those times of thinking on or back in the States, thinking about how that Camino helped you or changed you in a way? Yeah, it was It was born that day at Cruz de Ferro. Cruz de Ferro, wow. Yeah, and I, I didn't really necessarily know that it was born that day, mm -hmm. but it was. Um What happened is when I was when I was deployed, we took uh, a good number of casualties. Good number of people mm -hmm. got you know, good. That's a bad word for it. A, a large number of people. A large mm -hmm. number of people were were killed. Um, and so the one thing that both the article had talked about, the movie had a highlight of the little bit of advance, like, well, let me look to see if there's any tips as to packing, things like that. Um, I saw multiple references to the Crucifero and the idea of carrying a stone representing a burden that you want to leave at the foot of the cross. And so I, I said, I, I want to leave the burden of the people who were killed. Mm -hmm. And so San Antonio, I, when I deployed from the United States to Iraq, I was stationed at a place called Fort Hood, which is here in Texas. Mm -hmm. And it's only a couple hours north of San Antonio, two and a half hours north of San Antonio. So when I, when I started getting myself organized and, and putting things together so that I could go, I took a day and I drove up to I drove up to Fort Hood and I went out to the training ranges where we had done all of our preparation in getting ready to go to Iraq. And I picked up a stone from, took a, picked up stones from the training area, one representing each person that was killed. Um, or whether, whether killed directly or, or, mm -hmm. or died as, as an immediate result of the combat experience. And so at that point, I picked up 18 stones and I, I dedicated myself to carrying those 18 stones and, and leaving them at the foot of the cross. So I, I get up top of the top of the mountain there and If you, if you happen to know the person who's got the key to the chapel, that'd be really nice to know for a future use. But um, mm -hmm. well, you know, don't the worry. That's, I love when people give me things to do. 
the chapel is locked up. And so I just go to one of those. If you're looking at the chapel, there's those two, maybe three picnic tables off to the right hand mm -hmm. side. And so I went over there and I set up and I celebrated the mass and I made each of those 18 uh, service members the special intention of the mass. And then I went over and I set each one of them at the foot of the at the foot of the cross there at Crucifero. And not that I then forget about them or not that you know that they're not part of my history or anything, mm -hmm. but I'm not I wanted to be free of having a sense of personal burden. Because mm -hmm. uh, those are people that I ministered to while we were deployed together. And uh, and then I ministered to their their most immediate friends, the people that were on the same uh, squads and platoons and fire teams uh, that were dealing with the grief of having lost a friend. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so as I, I set them all in place and as I, as I stood up, I thought, okay, now what is, what lays ahead of me civilian ministry wise? Mm -hmm. This is, this is kind of my, my spiritual end of the military ministry, what is going to be in front of me as far as civilian ministry is concerned? As I turned and I stepped down off of the big mound of stones, there's a, a young lady there and she's crying. She's just absolutely sobbing. And I asked her if she wanted me to pray for her and she didn't speak English. And, and but there was somebody else nearby and it's like, I can, I can interpret for you. And I said, okay, ask her if she would like prayer. Yes. Okay. So I pray for her and um, she doesn't, she doesn't speak, she doesn't speak English. The person that interpreted the question was not interpreting the prayer, yeah. but still when finished, their whole countenance has changed. Her face was brighter. Um, her tears had stopped and she picks up her pack and she starts uh, down the trail. I was like, okay, well, let me go get my pack from where I left it and start. And right as I turn, there's a, there's a man standing there and, and he was a Spanish speaker. And the first person, I had no idea. I had no ability to communicate. Uh, the Spanish speaker was like, okay, you know, I've, I've got a, at least a handful of words, right? I can, mm -hmm. and you know, uh, he asked for prayer. He's like, me next, you know? Like, <laughs> so, so I prayed for him. And, and honestly, you would think, you would think that I had inserted a light into his face, but his light, his face was just glowing when finished the prayer. And as soon as, you know, as soon as the amen had been said, he smiled and gives me this huge hug, just, just bright, bright, and just bounded off down the trail. And then at that point, I was like, you know, maybe I should just look around and see if there's <laughs> anybody else. We should start a praying point over there and make a living out of Cruz de Ferro. Eh, maybe. <laughs> so the next Tomás o Manjarín. And uh, so I get my, I get my pack. Yeah, I could live, I could live with uh, Tomás, right? <laughs> they will make a great couple. I, I can probably, you know, you probably will fit really well together. He, I stayed there the first, the first Camino. I stayed there for you the stay night. with Tomás. Yeah, it was cold. <laughs> it we'll, was cold. we'll save that one for another interview because that's one of the things, not many people, and I think, you know, Tomás is a great person of the Camino with all the pros and cons of Tomás, but, but yeah. yeah but it, it was a great night. So we'll, we should come back to that at another time. But uh, so I get my stuff and I, and I start walking and I said, I just said to myself, that was really healing. Mm -hmm. That was a really healing experience. And I didn't, I didn't know how healing is that like for them or for you, for me, for me, I, I have no, both. That, that, that was the beauty of it. Like for both. Yeah. I, I, they, they clearly were moved. I mean, it, it was obvious that they were moved. Um, but I, I knew right away that I had experienced a healing. And the more I walked from that day on all the way to Santiago, I became more and more aware of how significant that healing was. And by the time I got to Santiago, I said, 
I need to figure out a way to bring other veterans out on the Camino so that they have the opportunity to experience this kind of healing. And that's how Warriors on the Way was, was born. Um, and I, even when I got to Santiago, I didn't realize how profound the healing was. So I, I was, I'm going to do a jump off of the Camino just for a second. That was September, first part of October. Um, that following May, I was in Lourdes. I was on pilgrimage in Lourdes. And I had failed to bring with me a journal. I always like to journal on pilgrimage. I never pilgrimage, I never journal at home, but I always like to journal on pilgrimage. And I had forgot to bring a journal with me. And so it took a few days. If you're down, if I don't know if you've been, but if you're down right yes, where, been a couple of where times. the uh, uh, Esplanade is, you know, there's no place to just buy a notebook. You have to get mm. into the actual city <laughs> proper. There's all the people, all the shops that are set up right around the grotto, they're all trinket shops and souvenir yeah. shops and stuff like that. So it took me forever to find a notebook. And when I was deployed, the majority of our the majority of our casualties were in the month of May 2007, and the majority of them were in a single day, May 19th. And from the from that first year that it happened, and every year thereafter. The month of May has always been a, a challenging month for me. Mm -hmm. Had been, and May nineteenth, like I didn't even want to go outside. Like I would just shut myself off from the world. Mm -hmm. And so I went. I finally got. I finally got my notebook, and I sit down. I order a, a, a glass of wine, and I pull out my pen, and I check my watch. May nineteenth. I write May nineteenth across the top of the of the page, like May 19th, that's an important day. That's, that's a really important day. It's not my birthday. It's not, it's not. And I just start rattling off all the important days that I have in my life. And well, it'll come to me eventually. And I started my journaling. Wow. So profound was the healing that occurred at Cruz de Ferro. You didn't even that remember in a place that it's more easy to remember anything like that because I'm like one of the things that is learned for the ones that are not from the people that is sick from the people that is suffering yeah so so here I was you know, people go to Lourdes all the time for healing mm -hmm. and so here I was in Lourdes and not receiving a healing at Lourdes but being made aware at Lourdes of the healing that I had received on the community. Wow. So, so that's that. So got back, um, going back to the Camino and Warriors on the way, got home, started designing, okay, if this is going to be something for veterans, what does it have to include? What does it need to look like? How are we going to organize it? I've got a wonderful, uh, professional colleague, Dr. Landry, uh, who deals with personal resilience, her mm -hmm. psychologist, uh, her, her field of research is, is personal resiliency, extremely wonderful woman of faith. And so I went and spoke with her and I said, this is what I'm designing. And I really think that the veterans who go on this need to have their spiritual health looked after and their mental health looked after and we had worked together when i was in the army she she's a department of army civilian teaching at the army medical center in school where i taught in my last couple of years in the army and so we had that working teaching relationship and i said would you be, would you be interested in in participating in this and she said yes absolutely and so then went and finished designing it out, figuring out what we would need, figuring out a rough estimate bus budget, filing all the paperwork with the government in order to be a registered charity, 501c3 status as it's known here, and soliciting donations and just putting out as much information we could in the different veteran organizations, we're gonna do this. And, and we, got our first batch of pilgrims and we got a good number of donations 
are, I'll say, you know, another opportunity that, uh, or another example that I think God is, is blessing this is that when we got the first batch of pilgrims and it was time to commit to going, we didn't have all the money yet. We were under budget as far as cash on hand is concerned. And it's like, it's too late. We, we have to go, we have to, we have to do this. And either the money will come in or I'll just pay this off for the rest of my life. <laughs> and so I, I went on the words on the way Facebook page and I put, um, I found some old, in, in, a, in an older book, some hand drawn maps with some highlight cities and just about every one of them had at least one of the places we were gonna stop. And so I scanned those and I put, you know, Warriors on the Way is currently going through this and this is what we're doing and this is why we're doing it. And if you'd like to help, please go to, and a donation link. And then I scheduled each one of those to pop up during the day on the day that we'd be in that town. And by the time we got to Santiago, our budget shortfall had been made up. Wow. From donations. So again, the Camino provides. Yep. It is incredible. And and I know we've already been in more than an hour. And you know, I would love to invite you another day to maybe with some members of Warriors on the way and we can go further and how the Camino helped oh, and yeah. how the Camino changed it. But I would love to focus right now on, on what is the, the next, you know, right now with a year with no no pilgrims, with no being able to bring those soldiers here to Spain, probably you have a list of people waiting to come. So what can people do to help you? What In which way they can support warriors on the way? Okay, thank you very much. Yes, we had a group ready for 2020, um, which once we realized, you know, I, I kept being optimistic that this would, you know, I think, I think most people were optimistic that it would be quickly controlled and we would be back mm -hmm. uh, to a, a, at least a semi-regular schedule. And ultimately we had to take the 2020 group and postpone them to 2021. And now we're sitting a year later and asking ourselves, you know, are we going to have to postpone again? Because we have to, in order to get a dozen people on the same plane, you have to buy your tickets way in advance. And with, without a solid message from the Spanish government, yes, you'll be allowed in. Yes, you'll be allowed to walk the Camino. I can't buy tickets in, in May I'm or the way. first part of June um, and, 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 and risk that. That's not a good use of, of the funds that have been entrusted to us by our many hmm. donors. Uh, so we're, we're currently just, you know, really anxious for some kind of either a solid yes or a solid no, so we can make a decision. Mm -hmm. Um, and for the, but for those, if we, if we're forced to postpone again, everybody that's on the current list will be allowed to stay on the list, uh, assuming that their 2021 calendar will permit it. Mm -hmm. We need people to know that we exist. Right, that which is so. Thank you for having us on the show. Um, you. you know, the, the more we, we spread the word, the more people will help the way the. And I always say, you know, I'm here because the Camino helped me. You're here because the Camino showed you the way. And if we can help others, I, you know, whatever mission in, in life than that. Right. Uh, so we, we need veterans to know that we exist so that they'll apply. Uh, and I, and I, at, we do have a full list and we have a waiting list, but I ask people to apply anyway because uh, you never know when there's a person who, who needs to drop. Mm -hmm. And we, don't, we do not do first come first serve. We, everybody, part of the application is writing a narrative, explaining what they're doing or what they expect, what they want. And we use those narratives to try to put together the best team as possible. And so you know, our, first, our first trip out everybody had been an actual combat line soldier except for our medic and our mm -hmm. the medic that we had with us was out with the combat line soldier so they had a very similar experience the second trip out it was primarily medical personnel almost all medical personnel and so we we try to form our teams so that they that they'll gel and up together better right 
Um, so, so people think, oh, well, you're full and you have a waiting list. I don't have a chance. No, go ahead and, and if you're interested in going, ask for an application because the waiting list is constantly in flux based on who's going to be the next best fit, mm -hmm. not just next in line. But they have to be from the U.S. military, any branch. U.S. military, any branch. We are open to bringing people from other militaries and did have one application in the first year, but then he was not able to travel for some reason and, mm -hmm. and had to let go. Um, but it, it is our, our focus to, you know, the U.S. military is our focus is what I'm most familiar mm -hmm. with. But that that is not to say that other militaries would be automatically yeah. turned away. Mm -hmm. uh, and then for, for everybody else, the reality is, like mentioned earlier, we're a, we're a registered charity. We're a 501c3, so people get their tax benefit when donating, and we run completely off donations. Everything that comes in is used for real pilgrimage expenses. So there, Dr. Landry, and now we've added to our, our psychology team, Dr. Landry and Dr. Phillips uh, are, they, they, give their time, they give their talent. The, a former Marine Corps officer, Jim, he comes in and he kind of runs logistics for us, making sure that everybody stays organized. Mm -hmm. Nothing like it, nothing like, like, probably the most disciplined organization of, of, the, of our military branches, the Marines are, are, are the most rigidly uh, disciplined. So if you want to make sure that you're going to, get someplace on time, have a Marine holding the watch. So you have to put um, a, a Marine in your Camino team and an Italian, so he's in charge of cooking? Well, that would be a, that would be brilliant, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but everybody, everybody who's involved, myself, Dr. Landry, Dr. Phillips, Jim, we, you know, we're giving our time and we, we give our own money into the program. So nobody, mm -hmm. nobody is taking out of the program. Everything that comes in goes to a real expense. And, and I've had people, oh, I wish I had this much so I can donate. It's like, okay, well, you don't have that much. Donate $5. $5 will That's buy a pilgrim. Cup, you know, yeah, I'll, I'll get five. If you're still early enough, if you haven't gotten too close to Santiago yet, I'll get five pilgrims their coffees with that $5. Yeah, and a tapa. <laughs> so that's kind of like yeah. half a meal for five pilgrims. Yeah. So whether whether you can whether you can give $5, whether you can fully sponsor individually, and we do have, there's a couple of people who've repeatedly fully sponsored individual pilgrims uh, the last couple of years at you know, that's 3000 the working budget's $3,750 mm -hmm. uh, or anywhere in between, you know, every single bit of money that comes in will go to help a, a combat veteran heal from their PTSD and their moral injury symptoms. And to, to go back, I said how significant my healing was a minute ago to, to demonstrate how well this program is working because of everything that's involved. The Camino is the greatest place to bring every element of PTSD care and moral injury care together in the same spot. Because things that have been proven to work is going outside. Well, the Camino, you're outside. Put, putting yourself under a positive physical strain, also known as exercising. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, so you're, you're, you're walking, you're carrying a backpack every day being around people that have a same or similar experience. That's why, that's why we work to build the best team we can mm -hmm. each out of each total group that, that submits, how do we narrow it down to the best team possible? Taking care of both spiritual and mental health needs. You know, I, I could never ask for better people to work with than my partners in this program, Dr. Landry and Dr. Phillips. We, we work side by side proving that spirituality and faith and behavioral health and psychiatric psychological world are not enemies. Too many people have mm -hmm. a false impression of that, that we work together uh, in order to help people. And you bring all of this together and we, we administer uh, before and after 
PTSD symptom assessments. And we consistently show a 70% reduction in symptoms wow. from we're, the start of the pilgrimage. We're to based the on the, uh, the average American treatment with this medicine and all this kind of. Incredible. Right. Yeah. We, and no drugs involved. Just, just, just being outside, putting your body through some stress, getting the support from one for your fellow pilgrims, getting the 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 spiritual and psychiatric psychological support celebrating the mass every morning so it's good uh good positive spirituality <laughs> all of these things are are proven each one of them is proven to individually reduce symptoms and you put them all together in this package that we've that we've designed and the and our pilgrims are experiencing amazing results that's living proof of why you they can be keep coming back and coming back or why the Camino there is more people now than ever going back to the Camino so that's what I say the Camino has something that other places don't have and the, and the only real proof of that is like if you haven't walked it yet there's no way you and I can explain it we can talk we can chat but that's one of the magic of the Camino you only know once you walk it and once you walk it you have that little bag in, in you that every time you see a pillow every time you see anything Camino related this is smiling your face and, and, you know, my friends, your friends are probably tired of listening to stories, but <laughs> once you That's walk, true. it is this thing that you get two of us together here and we can be walking, talking for five hours, six, and like, we can talk till tomorrow, but I'm like, I don't want to get, you know, anyone tired up on the Camino before they started, but it is one of those things that you have to live through it. And and the thing you have set it up with waters on the way, I think is, you know, it's, it's what it people need right now. And I think the Camino has that power that, you guys in the States, I found out, you know, that there's many ways of using the Camino through different situations of life. And I guess that's what the Camino has to offer. And, and I think we're going to see more and more of these projects coming up to the Camino. Yeah, I agree. And you talk about the, the difference between trying to explain and understand. There's a, there's a saying here, uh, you may have something similar, and it's, if you understand, I don't have to explain. And if I have to explain, you'll never understand. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make a t-shirt out of that for the Camino. If I have to explain <laughs> the Camino, you know, I will give it to you. So you put it on your website as merchant. <laughs> anyway, okay. Steve, it's been a pleasure talking to you. And as I said, I would love to invite you and some of the members of, of your team, of the, the people that have, you know, go through the through the waters on the way. And maybe we can do another day a live, you know, and explain to all the people how this program works, why it works. And we can, you know, then help you reach more funds so you can take a bigger team of people into the Camino. And I only have to invite you that you have to visit the best city of the Camino, Pamplona. So maybe next year you should walk a little farther instead of Astorga. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what, the uh, I'm gonna give you a two part answer. The first one is Astorga is an intentional start point because most Americans can get two weeks away from work. I know. Right? And that's, that, I mean, it's, it's so pure, maybe next time we can only, you can do a double year Camino. It's my, my plan for the, when I go on my next personal one, which who knows, it might be this year if I have to postpone the official one. Mm -hmm. uh, but my, my plan is, is to start in Saint-Jean. And, and so I will, I will make sure that you know when I'm nearing Pamplona. Let me know even a little early, maybe I will jump in. You know, there's always a great excuse to go over St. Jen and walk a couple case. Funny story, the first day they opened Pamplona, you know, on the, after the, the big, 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 uh, I told my brother, uh, what are you doing tomorrow morning? I'm like, I'm going to, to work. I'm like, no, you're not. You're driving me to Rontes Valles. I ran from Rontes Valles to Pamplona. <laughs> It wasn't the Camino, but it, it was what I needed and it gave me, you know, but it, it, it was weird with the Camino with no privilege, but I truly believe that the, the stage of Rontes Valles and St. Jenny is so well prepared for the for the suffer because it's really hard. It's extremely yeah. hard and, and it's your first day, you're not ready. So the whole situation and the whole Camino is well designed. Astorga, it's a beautiful place also and for, you know, when you don't have that many days, it's, it's great, but maybe you should start thinking about different Caminos, maybe next year a Portuguese or a Primitivo or... Mm. We'll have to look the 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 challenge for um, to try to do that with a group is you have to have you, you can't have questions you have to know where you're yeah. sleeping you have to right? know everything right uh, but yes I definitely that's definitely a plan for myself is I want to experience some of the the different communos because the my my plan for a personal communal because I did not 
go from Saint Jean to Leon. I went from Leon to Santiago as to go Saint Jean, Leon, and then detour up to Oviedo, and then Oviedo on the Primitivo down to Santiago. And that way, everything will be fresh first time, uh, other than where I turn that corner in Leon. Uh, <laughs> Other than that, the entire the entire trip will be will be new. You will have to go to the to the track station for sure and check if they have them they steal the machine and and get a beer over there. Okay, we're, okay, we'll, I'll get more information from that from you because that sounds good. <laughs> anyway, there there is an and you know there is many caminos now right now growing in Spain right now. We have the, the Ignatian Way that goes to the following the steps of San Ignatius of Loyola. That is a new way. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a beautiful. Uh, a lot, right? Yeah, it goes from, from Loyola to Montserrat. That's on my, on my waiting list here in Pamplona. We have a pilgrimage that is called, uh, it goes to the castle where St. Francis Xavier was born. It's just 40K from Pamplona. So, you know, plenty of other communities to walk if you have the time. Maybe I'll have to have, a, maybe I'll have to intend to just spend a day in Pamplona. Uh, we can visit San, you know, the guy, if you want, we can go and do a little tour, detour to the, to the main places. And one of the places that they record the, the new TV show from Amazon, the, the Three Caminos, is not part of the Camino officially, but it's a, a famous a famous uh, abbey in, in, in Navarra. But from the Castillo de Javier goes through the Camino Aragonés. That's, you know, the other entry of the Camino Frances. No, it's Camino Frances Aragonés. And, and that's a beautiful one that if you also have a chance, I, I always invite people. That's a harder one. It's much higher, higher. Pyrenee, you know, more hiking, stronger, but almost no one. So if you're looking for that second, third Camino that you're looking more to walk by yourself, it's a beautiful journey and it's seven days okay. into the Camino Frances. Okay. Yeah, it's good to know. Anyway, Steve, thank you so much for joining us today. I hope that there is more Caminos and more warriors on the way that find, you know, what they are looking and they're walking off the, the war and, and all that they have to walk and, and find that peace and that Santiago gives and the Camino gives to a lot of people. So let's hope that we, you know, we will put all the in the notes all the the places that the people can go to warriorsontheway.org, also your links to Facebook and Instagram. And if anyone has, you know, anyone their thoughts that think that maybe benefit from Warriors on the Way, because we know that sometimes people that are suffering from PTSD is not in social media and stuff. So if you find anyone that you think will benefit, I will put your information. So contact Steve and he will gladly help you. And I hope that we will continue to see each other many many years. Yes, very good. Thank you. Thank you, Ultreya, and buen camino.